is capitalism still so resented and so always under attack and always regarded to be somehow incompatible with the great moral traditions of the West. Why is capitalism not popular? Uh, this is the real question. And, and uh, this has really been, the th it was the theme of wealth and poverty. And it has prompted me to work for the last 10 years or so on a new theory of economics uh, that uh, derives from information theory. And information theory is the fundamentals set of propositions that underlies all computer science and all communications of uh, the internet, our smartphones or teleputers as I call them, all these devices, this fabric of the information economy, all is ultimately reposes on, uh, a, on information theory. And uh, so the key propositions of information theory for economics, as I sum them up, are really three. And one of the, the first one is information is knowledge. Now this, this seems like a peculiar, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Inf wealth is knowledge. The key, the key to information theory is its foundation that wealth is knowledge. And uh, we know this because essentially the Neanderthal in his cave, as the great Thomas Sowell has expounded, the Neanderthal in his cave had all the physical resources that we have today. The difference between our age and the Stone Age is entirely the accumulation of knowledge. It's not an accumulation of stones. Of the, so knowledge, I mean, wealth is knowledge, is the sort of founding proposition. An economist of information at MIT last year, Cesar Hidalgo, uh, expressed it in a different way. He says, when an, when an expensive car crashes into a wall, all its value disappears, even though every atom and molecule remains. The car is knowledge. Value is information. Okay, so that's wealth is knowledge, essentially. We want to understand that. But if wealth is knowledge, it has consequences. That means that growth, economic growth, is essentially learning. It's uh, not some accumulation of material or something. It is learning. And we can see this um, all my life, really, well, since 1980 or so. I've been studying learning curves. And this is the most thoroughly documented proposition in business analysis, the learning curve. With every doubling of total units sold, the cost per unit dropped by between 20 and 30%. And learning curves have been uh, described for everything from eggs, poultry eggs, to lines of software code, to transistors on microchips, to insurance policy dollars, to trucking miles, uh, you name it. Uh, there's a learning curve that applies to it. The more time you spend learning, the more you learn, uh, the 
more efficiently uh, you produce any new, new value. So the second is growth is learning, but it's a particular kind of learning that was illuminated by Karl Popper, a great Austrian philosopher of uh, the mid 20th century. Karl Popper showed that in order for a scientific proposition to have any meaning, it must be falsifiable. It must be stated in a form in which it can be refuted. This is a key proposition of the scientific method, which is the most successful method for generating new knowledge and learning. And the reason capitalism succeeds is because it observes Popper's law. Every free market business, every enterprise can fail. It has a test of success and failure. And whether it succeeds or failure or fails, it generates learning. You can, uh, you can uh, uh, learn something because the business is, can go bankrupt. Bankruptcy is an important discipline for all enterprise. And uh, because, uh, and, and this is important because uh, governments constantly try to guarantee stuff all the time. They want to guarantee growth, but uh, a guarantee prohibits learning and thus prohibits growth. Uh, so all these policies that are designed to guarantee and plan and absolutely assure growth prohibit the learning, which is, is the essence of growth. Because if, you, if it can't fail, it can't really yield any learning. It's, uh, so, so that's the, so growth is learning. And uh, the third great uh, proposition of inf information economics is how you measure uh, learning. And that is money is time. And, uh, and uh, this really unifies all the other principles, the principles of money is time. And I'm gonna devote much of my uh, lesson today to money as time. And, uh, and the f first principle I think of money as time is that material resources are abundant and changeless. They're the atoms in the universe and they're available, as we said, to the caveman and to us. There's no scarcity of anything uh, in the uh, index of money as time. But for trade-offs and transactions, priorities, goals, money must be scarce. It, it's got to be an, an element that uh, allows you to trade off scarce things, one thing against another. And what is the ultimate scarcity in all economic life? What remains scarce when everything else grows abundant? What remains scarce is time. Money is time. And time is is the ultimate resource that constrains all economic activity. It's uh, reflected in uh, compound interest. It's, uh, it's really key to all economic activity. You have to make decisions uh, in the face of the inexorable passage of time, 24 hours a day. And uh, money is, uh, 
is uh, what remains scarce. I mean, time is what remains scarce when everything else grows abundant. It's the ultimate resource of economics. Uh, this is not a question, Julian Simon, who you heard from Gail Pooley yesterday, who really has developed this money as time uh, more fully than anyone else with his colleague, Marion Tupi, um, but uh, called the, the ultimate resource is really the human mind. And uh, that's an important principle as well. But money is the way the essential scarcity of time is, fun, is fungibly anywhere in the same homogeneous terms, translated into all transactions, investments, and valuations in an economy. It's uh, money uh, embodies this scarcity of time, the 24 hours a day, proceeding on inexorably into an essentially infinite future. Um, money is, is uh, the way this phenomenon of time is manifested and, and exerts its force and is embodied in uh, every transaction you make all across the economy. When you walk into a store to buy something, what you are really uh, bringing is your previous expenditure of productive effort, the time you spent to earn that money. And when you run out of money, you're really running out of the time to earn more money. That's your, your that's what, what you're running out of, in essence. So money is, is uh, time. And it's, um, and it's crucial to understand that it's a measure of wealth. Money is not wealth itself. Time isn't wealth itself. Time is the condition of all activity. Um, so um, money is a measuring stick of value, not a vessel of value. Should I respond to this? No, we can do it later. Yeah. All right, <laughs> thank you. Um, it's a metric, not a commodity, and a measuring stick cannot be part of what it measures. So true prices, as Gail Pooley explained so eloquently yesterday, are time prices. The time to earn the money, the time to earn the ability to buy a good or service is the time price. That's the true price. It's also, and the time to produce a good or service. And both are measured in hours and minutes across the entire economy, across the all uh, millennia of history, the same measure applies to both the ability to buy a good, the price you have to pay to buy a good, and uh, the what it costs to produce a good. And they're both uh, measured in hours and minutes. And uh, across the entire economy, they're essentially the same because supply equals demand. You can't, uh, you can demand more, but uh, unless you supply this uh, expenditure of time, you, which is common to all goods and services, you, um, you can't uh, acquire it. So um, they're both the same across an entire economy, but in any specific transaction, the value of the good or commodity that you purchased is the same as the, as the time it took to earn the money to buy it. 
So uh, probably a, one of the great virtues of time prices, the number of hours and minutes it takes you to earn the money to buy a good or service, service is that it, in one universal number, it uh, gauges the effects of economic progress. Both the increase of wages, this is the economic progress in parts, but also the drop in costs as, uh, as we go move down learning curves and can produce things more efficiently and produce more things more creatively. And this means because there's one universal number, hours and minutes applicable everywhere, we can dispense with much of the activity of modern economics, which is focused on indices of various kinds, calculating consumer price indices, GDP deflators, where you try to find the real prices for, by adjusting for the de deterioration of currencies or, you know, there's constant efforts by economists to estimate real prices amid the model of consumer price uh, inflation and deflation uh, and the effects of economic progress and, and, and most dramatically and overwhelmingly is the single biggest industry in the world economy, overwhelmingly. It's not food, transportation, shelter, any of the things you might imagine. The biggest industry in the world economy is currency trading. Just uh, interrelating all these different currencies manipulated by central banks is $6.7 trillion a day. And that's up 30% in the last three years, the amount of currency trading in this biggest industry that chiefly enriches 11 banks, uh, increased 30% in the last three years, according to the Bank for International Settlements in Switzerland. And uh, during a period when we had trade wars and currency conflicts and and economic recession and confusion. Uh, uh, but uh, the currency trading boomed. It was a booming business uh, for the last three years. So this, this is an effect of uh, the Tower of Babel that afflicts world money. And uh, it's the scandal of money and time prices banish all this confusion and, and uh, identify value in, in uh, the single global universal units of hours and minutes and even seconds. Uh, time prices can be crudely calculated in macroeconomic terms by dividing total what they call gross domestic product, GDP, by the total hours of work. So it, uh, which it yields GDP per worker. That's, and uh, roughly the time price is, uh, can be calculated from uh, the total hours of work per worker in uh, producing global GDP. And the difference between the time to earn the money to buy a good or service and the time to produce it is the profitability, essentially. 
Now, money, that's the profit. Now, money is time, as I said, but time is not money. Uh, uh, you, it takes, you have to invent money to create this fungible system. That is, fungible means it can be used anywhere for any kind of transaction and transmits a universal value system through these transactions. That took the invention of money and, and double entry bookkeeping and now triple entry bookkeeping with uh, new uh, uh, cryptocurrencies that are a great uh, breakthrough in the recent, uh, recent world economy, the blockchain. And uh, when you're creating monies, a currency, it's, and uh, if you don't tie it to time, you uh, incur real trouble. You begin, you create new models of arbitrage, such as are manifested in this $6.7 uh, trillion a day of uh, currency trading and all uh, debates over inflation and hedonic adjustments of hedonic comes from the Greek word meaning pleasure and you try to calculate the amount of pleasure that your smartphone yields you and it's a mass of subjectivity that uh, is not a suitable fungible um, concept to underlie a world economy based on objective transactions. So you can manage money and uh, either by quantity or by price. Now, the whole school of monetarism has, this, has said that really what matters is the supply of money. And uh, that um, and that the supply of money should be regulated carefully. And various forms of monetarism prevail in most of the central banks of the world. They think that increasing and reducing the supply of money is, is a suitable activity to maintain some steady progress of economic activity. But, uh, this is a mistake. And it's, uh, if you fix the supply, it means that uh, the prices are going to be volatile. They're going to go up and down. They will not reflect the universal um, constant of the passage of time. They, uh, they become, and they turn money into a speculative entity rather than a measuring stick. They, it becomes a magic wand for uh, politicians and central bankers. So r rather than fixing the supply, you got to fix the, fix the value and tie it to some physical constant. And all, uh, you know, world trade is really made possible not by all this chaos of currency trading, but by all the measuring sticks that we use that allow a semiconductor manufactured in Taiwan to be based on a, on a chip design uh, made in Israel, Tel Aviv, uh, and uh, a system architected in Cupertino and all these are unified and rendered compatible by minutes uh, and seconds. They're the ultimate uh, measure of all of physical constants. And uh, lumens, watts, uh, kilowatts, um, kilograms of mass, uh, all these, all these uh, nanometers, 
meters, you know, these, these fundamental measuring sticks make possible all global commerce and progress. And, and uh, the reason the world economy is currently in its muddle and morass is because uh, the money is totally lost its properties as a measuring stick. Not totally, but to a great degree. And, uh, uh, and uh, this really, I believe, but historically happened when we went off gold, which uh, the key to the stability of gold as a monetary measuring stick is that the time to extract an incremental uh, gram of gold uh, has not really changed since uh, the people sieved gold from streams. Uh, you know, you could, uh, the vast gold mines take decade to open and develop and the ultimate time to produce a di an additional ingot is no greater, is no, is hardly changed today from the time that uh, in the gold rush, people uh, went to rivers, uh, brooks, and dishes, and uh, to sieved out gold ingots. So, um, the so what we really need to do is, uh, but gold is not very convenient in a digital age for c conducting trillions of dollars of transactions and in, in a global economy. So really we need to develop new money and that's the whole uh, real climax of Life After Google, my book, is really about how you produce money that uh, ultimately can be tied to, to time and uh, can uh, uh, usher in a new age of a new golden age of, of transactions that uh, allow long-term planning and uh, long-term commitments that can yield long-term learning and growth and uh, knowledge in an information economy of uh, capitalism. So, and the blockchain has been, is a crucial instrument of this great revolution that is sweeping the world economy and is um, described and explained through the information theory of economics, where um, wealth is knowledge, growth is learning, money is time, and uh, and we have uh, and and information is really freedom. This is what. Uh, Claude Shannon really demonstrated the amount of information, the amount of surprisal, unexpected bits. Information is surprise in and, and, and Shannon. And the amount of surprisal is really determined by the freedom the degrees of freedom that the creator of the message or the creator of the good of service or whatever, the creator of the message had, how big his symbol system is, how big his imagination is, how much freedom he has determines the amount of information or surprisal. Shannon called it entropy because that, because it, uh, Entropy is a probability a measure that uh, um, measure of disorder that is epitomized as surprise. No, when you're, when you're done, so, so that's that's a very fast, big mind dump on the information theory of economics and life after capitalism, but. Uh, a, We'll be asking, answering questions for the rest of the morning and
I hope we'll make some progress. <laughs> and Gail to to Pooley will be back, and he's the real genius at this this subject. Terrific. Thanks, George. We actually are getting a bunch of questions. And so some of you ask really good questions. There's a question about the labor theory of value that Gail Pooley went ahead and jumped in uh, and answered. So we won't deal with that. But George, actually, I want to, I think this is something a bunch of people are interested in. I mean, what do you think is a driving the resentment towards uh, to capitalism? I mean, do you think it has, it's purely misunderstanding? Do you think it has something to do with this confection of the currency trading that perplexes people? What is it that right now you think driving the attack and resentment for capitalism? I, I think, um, um, I, I believe that one, uh, that fundamentally I made the argument in um, Wealth and Poverty that, that, that there's, the alternative is saying capitalism is an information system, is to say it's an incentive system. And all capitalist economics accepts this image of the homo economicus, economic man is the essential agent of the system. And this economic man is governed by incentives. He's, he's um, rewards and punishments, carrots and sticks. He's, he's really a reflection of the psychology of the Skinner box, uh, which, which really, um, believed that human beings were blank slates that were completely shaped by their environment. And uh, the Skinner box is now a joke in um, psychology mostly, but uh, it, it survives in every economic model. So if you say uh, it's all incentives and rewards and punishment, then uh, if, you, if you are more greedy, mm -hmm. you're going to be more successful, that somehow greed has something to do with it, with capitalism. And I say the opposite. In Wealth and Poverty, I wrote that uh, greed leads as by an invisible hand to an ever-growing welfare state. The really greedy person wants unearned benefits mm -hmm. and uh, entitlements and and bounties that that it, he doesn't have to earn by expending his time mm -hmm. and and uh so the really greedy person petitions the government to uh uh give him a privileged position yeah and that's crony socialism it's, yeah. it leads to socialism not capitalism so so i i think that the, it was the fundamental big mistake of capitalist theory was to imagine this, that greed somehow, that, mm -hmm. that, that uh, you know, Jeff Bezos must be the greediest man in the world because he- That explains how rich he is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he extracted a hundred billion dollars from the economy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right.